Good evening, everybody, and welcome to WEHI's 2022 Annual General Meeting. I'm Jane Hemstrich, and I'm the President of WEHI's Board. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects and offer the respects of the WEHI Board to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from other communities who may be with us today. So welcome to you all, both in person and joining us online. It's wonderful to be able to gather here in person again, something I imagine that none of us will ever take for granted again. It's equally wonderful that we can have people join us online. And I welcome you online wherever you are. With the use of technology, we can expand and deepen our connection with our members, and that's wonderful. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our patron and honorary governor, Sir Gustav Nossel. Welcome, Gus. And to all other institute members, donors, bequesters, alumni, current and past members of the WEHI board and subcommittees, consumers, WEHI staff and students, and other special guests. Welcome to everybody. I'd like to acknowledge um, the presence of my fellow board members, uh, Vice President Professor Sir John Savile, who you can't actually see because he's joining us online from Scotland, Honorary Treasurer Rob Wiley, who you'll hear from shortly, Malcolm Broomhead, Associate Professor Pippa Connolly, John Dyson, Professor Christine Kilpatrick, Mari McDonald, Carolyn Viney, Dr. Anjali Weller, and Ki Wong. I'd also like to welcome WEHI's auditor, Annika de Troyes, who's a partner at Deloitte, and WEHI's advisor on the revised constitution, Stuart Grieve, who is a partner at Johnson, Wint Winter, and Slattery. Now, I've been advised by our company secretary, Joe Kirby, that a quorum is present in accordance with clause 41 of WEHI's constitution, dated the 27th of November, 2000. Institute members in attendance can vote. I knew you've got a little card to allow you to do that. And they can ask questions. Um, in person and there'll be somebody with a microphone to uh, allow you to do that. For people online, you can vote and ask questions through the designated member Slido page. So the first order of the business is the minutes from the 2021 annual general meeting, which was held on the 27th of May, 2021, and they've been circulated to Institute members. And this was a very bizarre annual general meeting because I think the only people in the room were me, Doug, and Rob Wiley, and all the rest of you were online. Um, the board has reviewed the minutes, and they'll be signed by me as a true and correct record. Does anyone have any questions or comments from Institute members on the minutes? And there any questions online? No. No questions, which is just how we like it. So uh, I'll now move on to the President's report, which reflects on the year we've had at WEHI since our last AGM. And first up, let me say I am so proud of WEHI staff, students, and collaborators all of whom embraced 2021 with remarkable conviction and focus, despite the considerable challenges posed by the continuing COVID-19 pandemic. From the launch of the Collaborative Brain Center uh, to securing support to establish an incubator for biotech startups, also a collaborative effort with the University of Melbourne and CSL, from groundbreaking discoveries in Parkinson's disease to much needed progress on COVID-19 treatments and early diagnosis. 2021 at WEHI was a year full of exceptional work carried out in exceptional circumstances. 
The advances WEHI has made in biomedical research to progress positive outcomes for patients would not have been possible without the Institute's strong supporter base. To our long-standing and loyal donors, and to those new to the WEHI family, thank you for your confidence in our institution and in our people. I'm thrilled to report that the Institute has had a record year for fundraising and philanthropy, generating vital funds to progress many important research programs. We are especially grateful to generous gifts in wills in 2021, which will support our researchers and facilitate an environment for transformative discoveries to be made over many years to come. A $26 million gift from the estate of Leslie Patricia Farrant will supercharge an area of ever-growing importance in health, data research. Pat and her late husband, John Farrant, had a passion for medical research and were dedicated and treasured supporters of WEHI. The funds from the request will strengthen our computing science facilities, including in artificial intelligence and machine learning. The new Center for Biologic Therapies was announced in 2021 with philanthropic support from the estates of brothers and sisters John Thompson and Mary Helena Thompson, who left a $15 million gift to WEHI. With our collaborator CSL, this new center based at WEHI will revolutionize the treatment of cancer, inflammatory and immunological disorders, and infectious diseases, including COVID-19. In addition to our research efforts, WEHI is committed to advocating for the mitigation of global warming and minimizing our own environmental impact. In 2021, WEHI's board endorsed our first environmental management and sustainability strategy. The strategy, which spans 21 to 23, was developed in consultation with experts in environmental management, as well as our staff and students, led by WEHI's Environmental and Sustainability Management Committee. It will guide our actions towards achieving carbon neutrality and address areas including energy, water, waste management, as well as sustainable investment and procurement practices. Under the strategy, WEHI will also enable research to address the health impacts of climate change. In 2021, WEHI also made a public statement acknowledging the scientific consensus on climate change and recognizing it as an issue of national and global concern requiring urgent action. Importantly, WEHI supports a robust evidence-based discussion about the best pathway to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, ensuring that diverse voices are heard, including those of our First Nations peoples. This evening, I'm pleased to welcome our newest WEHI members, Dr. Wendy Fisher, Ian Galbraith, Dr. Neil Galbraith, Sarah Galbraith, Sandra Nicola, Professor Thomas Sperling, Kyung Walker. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Angeli Weller, who is also the newest member of our board. Angeli is a passionate advocate for integrity, inclusivity, and innovation in business and capital markets. She has more than two decades of experience as a business ethics and an environmental, social, and governance strategist and researcher. She works across startups and multinationals to build ethical organizational cultures. We warmly welcome Anjali and look forward to her contribution to the board. Anjali joined the board in place of Peter Collins, who has now moved into a new role at WEHI as our specialist head of ethics and integrity. I'd like to sincerely thank Peter for all his deep insights and initiatives during his four years of service on the board and I'm pleased that WEHI will continue to benefit from his leadership and expertise in his new role. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to board members who joined us in 2021, Professor Jane Gunn and Ki Wong. You may remember that Jane, our University of Melbourne representative and the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, joined the WEHI board in February last year. An accomplished clinician researcher, 
Jane is supporting WEHI to strengthen our translational research capabilities. Key is an entrepreneur with expertise in startups who has established successful businesses across multiple industries and countries. Key joined us in July last year, and as WEHI looks increasingly to leverage an entrepreneurial mindset in our activities, I look forward to his contribution. I'd also like to acknowledge again Professor Sir John Saville, who became our board vice president in March last year as we farewelled Terry Moran. Sir John has very capably carried on Terry's efforts through 2021, and I extend my sincere thanks to him. Thank you also to all the other members of the board for your tremendous work over the last 12 months. It's been another big year for WEHI with many important decisions made. I've been so grateful to all of our board for their generosity, thoughtfulness and expertise, which has ensured a smoothly run organisation. Having seen what we've been able to achieve during these uncertain times, my deep admiration and gratitude goes out to the entire WEHI community. From our international staff and students who weren't able to visit their families, to the tireless efforts of our safety teams, and right across our research and professional services teams, I thank you all for your passion, your resilience, and your commitment. Now, let us move on to the annual report. The annual report for the year ending 31st of December 2021 has been circulated to members, and hard copies are available for those people who are attending in person. Some of the images in the report, including the front cover, can be brought to life by downloading the free WeHi Augmented Reality app on your smartphone or tablet. You'll find more information about this in the report, and I hope you'll have as much fun exploring the amazing images as I did. I now call for any questions from Institute members in relation to my report or the annual report. And I'll pause for a moment to allow members to enter their questions online. Does anyone in the audience have questions? And are there any questions online? No questions online. I now put the motion to institute members to endorse the annual report for the period ended 31 December 2021. Members voting online, please place your votes via the poll tab on Slido. For members voting in person, if you could wave your little card, please. Anyone against? I'll pause for a moment to allow the online votes to be counted. We have six online, all in the affirmative. Thank you. I declare the resolution carried, and I'll now hand over to our honorary treasurer, Rob Wiley. Well, good afternoon, members and guests. I'm pleased to present the Statement of Financial Position, the Statement of Profit and Loss and Other Comprehensive Income, the Statement of Cash Flows, the Statement of Changes in the Equity, and the reports of the Directors and of the Auditor in respect of the 12 months ended 31 December 2021. Although the impact of COVID-19 continued to be experienced to some extent throughout 2021, we did experience a strong rebound in the investment portfolio and started to see a return to more normal operations in our research laboratories. We continue to be very conscious of the need to preserve our investment capital base and our investment methodology reflects this. Our philosophy is to be in the market for the long term, and as at 31 December 2021, over 31% of the investment portfolio was in defensive assets, such as cash and interest-bearing securities. 
In addition, WeHi holds significant cash reserves set aside for operating purposes. I would now like to present our financial results for the 12 months ended 31 December 2021. The net surplus for the financial year was 57.5 million, compared with the 31.4 million surplus for the 2020 year. The 2021 surplus included an additional milestone receipt of 27.6 million relating to the Venetoclax monetization. In 2020, this was 36.7 million. It's great to see WeHi benefiting from the monetization of Venetoclax and from the strong sales growth being experienced over the past few years. This is the last milestone payment we will receive as part of the monetization agreement with the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. WeHi's total operating revenue for the year was 191.2 million which included 69.8 million of federal and state sourced revenue for research, investment income of 29.5 million, and donations and bequests amounting to 26.8 million. WeHi was very grateful to receive an additional 4.1 million in support from the federal government through the JobKeeper program, resulting in a total of 24. 1 million received over 2020 and 2021. We have ensured that this funding has been used to preserve jobs at WEHI, and the funding has allowed us to minimize the impacts of COVID on our research program, including our COVID research program. 66% of WEHI's operating expenditure was scientific related, 4% infrastructure and building related, 13% was expenditure relating to the delivery of WEHI strategic initiatives, and the remaining 17% being used to provide the professional services needed to support our scientists and WEHI's activities. As set out in Note 2Q, changes were made to the prior year comparatives in relation to the allocation of funds between the Investment Revaluation Reserve and General Funds. This adjustment does not impact on the result in 2021 or prior years. The 57 million surplus for the year, along with the net unrealized gains on the financial assets taken to equity of 52 million, has resulted in an increase in total funds or net assets of 109.5 million to a total of 867 million a very strong financial position for WEHI to continue to pursue its mission well into the future. We are very well supported by the financial community and I would like to acknowledge the contribution of Fiona Trafford-Walker, Stephen Milburn-Pyle, Stephen Merlicek and Andrew Scott who voluntarily serve on our investment committee. I would also like to acknowledge J.B. Weir and specifically Adam Blanahasset and Curtis Reid. As chairman of the Audit and Risk Committee, I would also like to express my appreciation to the members of this committee, including Malcolm Broomhead and Pippa Connolly, for their work on this important committee, which advises the board on its financial stewardship of the organization. WEHI's leadership group and the finance team should also be recognized for their efforts in providing sound financial management of WEHI's resources. Infrastructure funding is critical and we are pleased to acknowledge the support of the Victorian and federal governments. As you can see, WEHI partners with a range of people and organizations, which means we truly are brighter together. The external audit performed by Deloitte Tushimatsu progressed smoothly and there are no matters of major concern. A Deloitte partner, Annika de Toy, is here today and can answer any questions members may have on the audit. Members of WEHI, I now move that the statement of financial position, the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, the statement of cash flows, the statement of changes in equity and the reports of the directors and of the auditor 
for the financial period ended 31 December 2021 be received. We high members, are there any questions relating to the financial reports? Please submit questions via Slido or raise your hand. Are there any questions, Miguel? Thank you. I now put the motion to we high members. Votes can be submitted via the polls tab on Slido or by raising your card. All those in favor, please raise your card. Thank you. Against? Are there any? Thank you, Megan. I declare the resolution carried. Thank you, everyone. Jean. We now have an important item of special business to be addressed, a proposed change to WEHI's constitution. Members will have received details of the changes as part of the notice of meeting, including an explanatory statement. Changes to the constitution must be made by special resolution, which requires 75% of the votes cast, including proxies, to be in favor of the resolution for it to be carried. The requirement for a special resolution is per the Corporations Act and referred to in Clause 5 of WEHI's current constitution dated 27th of November 2000. WEHI's current constitution, as I said, was approved in 2000. Since that time, as you'll all be aware, the regulatory landscape and governance standards have changed considerably. The board was conscious that to ensure that WEHI continues to meet the highest governance standards, that a review of the constitution was timely. As outlined in the explanatory statement, the board accepted the recommendation to redraft the constitution rather than amend it. Details of the major changes are listed on pages five to seven of the explanatory statement that was uh, circulated to members with the notice of meeting. Most of the changes reflect the requirements under the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission governance standards. I'd like to emphasize that no changes were made to the objects, membership structure, or essential operating features of the document. The board unanimously endorsed the changes to the constitution in March this year, and I'm pleased to be joined here today by Joe Kirby, company secretary, and Stuart Greaves, who is a partner at Johnson, Winter and Slattery. They're the firm that oversaw the revision of the Constitution, and they can answer any questions that Institute members may have. So questions can be submitted through Slido, or the in-person audience can raise a hand. And I'll pause for a moment to allow uh, members to ask any questions that they might have. Are there any questions? And there are none on Slido. It's always the way when you get special people here to answer questions, there never are any. <laughs> I'd now, now like to ask Institute members to vote on the special resolution that the Constitution of the Water and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, adopted at the annual general meeting held of 27th of November 2000, be replaced with the revised Constitution circulated to members with the notice of meeting effective from the close of this meeting. Members voting online can submit their vote via Slido. For members voting in person, please raise your hand. All those in favor? All those against? Thank you. Thank you. I declare the resolution carried. Thank you, members and guests for your support with this important resolution. And I'll now hand over to WEHI Director, Professor Doug Hilton.
Thank you so much, Jane. And how lovely it is to see everybody in person in a room that is um, feeling really crowded and vibrant. And as Jane said, it was absolutely as much as I respect and am inspired by Rob and Jane, it is not quite the same uh, as it was last year. Much, much more energetic. So thank you, everybody. Great to see you. I've just returned from leave in beautiful South Australia, um, where my partner and I spent time in some of Australia's most remote places. And, and I've really felt that that isolation and tranquility has been the perfect opportunity to reflect, especially given the events of the last two and a half years. My first reflection really is this is my 14th AGM as director and my 35th AGM as a student or staff member at WEHI. And I feel just as strongly now as I did in 1986 as an undergraduate student attending my first AGM or in 2009 as my first year as director that this is the most important event on WEHI's calendar. It's important because it's the opportunity for our community, now 1,354 staff and students, and our board to report to you on how we've used the funding that you've entrusted us with. Funding that comes from your taxes via the NH and MRC and Medical Research Future Fund. Funding that comes from your exceptionally generous donations and bequests and funding that comes from partners who work with us to develop better ways to prevent, diagnose and treat disease. Second, while I was on leave, I was probably as far away from people as you can get in Australia. And yet what I reflected on in that isolation was the importance of community. And perhaps that reflection came because of the hyperpartisan times in which we live, Perhaps it was a reflection driven by the insanity that war has returned to Europe and unrest, repressive regimes and violence are present on almost every continent and on our TV screens every night. Perhaps it was being, at the time we went on vacation, three weeks into what has felt like an unrelentingly divisive and sometimes toxic election campaign. But those reflections made me think that institutions that bring together people, that unite our community in the pursuit of something ambitious and noble, rather than divide people and pit one group against another in what sometimes feels like a real version of the Hunger Games, are absolutely more important than ever. I think WEHI is one of those institutions because the vision and goals of our staff, our students and our board are shared so deeply with you, the people who support us, encourage us and sustain us and help us create, create a better community within WEHI and across Melbourne, Australia and globally. I honestly believe that this is more important than ever. My final reflection while away was on our network of collaborators. WEHI's record of scientific discovery and translation has not could not and in the future will not happen in a vacuum. We need partners that put aside competition in the knowledge we can achieve more together than we can separately. In Royal Melbourne Hospital, Peter Mack, the University of Melbourne, CSL, the Doherty Institute, Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the Burnett Institute, to name just a few, we have those partners. They are essential to what we wanted to deliver for the community and I salute and thank them and their supporters for their wholehearted contribution and generosity of spirit. I'd like to give one example, and that is of the Brain Cancer Centre. This illustrates our appetite with our partners to tackle what is a massive challenge, ending brain cancer as a terminal disease. Founded by Carrie's Beanies for Brain Cancer in partnership with WEHI, we've secured initial support from the Victorian government and are partnering with wonderful organisations across the Melbourne Biomedical Precinct and beyond, and we're taking a radically different approach. I'm not going to steal too much of Misty Jenkins and Jim Whittle's thunder 
as they will be presenting on the incredible work that's going on at the Brain Cancer Centre a little later in the program. And I'll have a little bit more to say about the genesis of its establishment. Another example of collaboration which we were really pleased to launch in October last year and on which Jane touched earlier is the new Centre for Biologic Therapies. The centre combines WEHI's expertise in immunology and cancer, inflammatory disorders and infectious disease with CSL's world-class human antibody library and experience in biologic drug discovery and development. Based right here at WEHI in Parkville, the centre will provide access to expert biological discovery and optimization capabilities, accelerating drug development into the clinic and ultimately addressing a current gap in Australian health and medical research. Not only will the centre allow us to drive collaborative, innovative research for discovery and translation, will also provide a boost to local jobs in manufacturing, academia, biotechnology and clinical services. The COVID-19 pandemic, for all of its negative impacts, has shown us the great need for these type of facilities, like those that have helped us expedite the development of new antiviral treatments. And I'm going to talk about one of the papers that has come from that work a little later. What I'm particularly proud of with this centre is it's the result of a strong, fruitful, long-standing relationship between WEHI and CSL, combined with the generosity of philanthropic support, again, as Jane said, from the John and Mary Thompson Estates. When you can bring together research excellence through the work being led by Professors Wei Hong Tam and Ian Wicks, with the truly outstanding translational expertise of Dr Andrew Nash's team at CSL and leverage this with the passion and foresight of our philanthropic community, it's really difficult to see how this could not succeed. These are just a couple of the collaboration highlights from last year. And I wish I had a lot longer to share with you some of the others. A big part of the success of our scientific program at WEHI is due to the expertise of our professional services staff. And I'd particularly like to thank the professional services leadership group. And most importantly, I think through 2020, 2021 and continuing into 2022, our COVID response team for their absolutely tire tireless efforts in 2021 as they have um, put together in the previous years. I'm really proud of the way our teams have conducted themselves with professionalism, resilience, and a spirit of continuous improvement to navigate the challenges presented by the pandemic. What's been really inspiring is that we've not deviated from the guiding principles that we put together in March of 2020, which seems so very long ago. To keep these important issues at the top of the mind, I'd like to remind you about them. They were the health and safety of our staff and students, which was forefront. The health and safety of our community, contributing to COVID-19 research. Keeping our long-term research on track. Keeping our teams together by ensuring continued employment and compliance, of course, with government regulations. We could not have navigated these seemingly endless challenges so ably without your support either as taxpayers or as donors and supporters. Your enthusiasm and commitment to our work has given us the flexibility to respond to the pandemic in really creative ways that we acknowledge were not available to many other research organisations. And behalf, on behalf of everybody here, students, staff and board, I want to thank you. In addition to our supporters in the community and our staff and students, one of the key ingredients of WEHI's success is its board. And this board holds management to account for delivering on our strategic plan. As part of this accountability, we report to the board on a range of metrics that relate to our peer-reviewed publications, which are the single most important way we communicate to the world about the discoveries we make. We are a far, far bigger organisation than, when we, that, than we were when I started at WEHI in 1986, and around double the size we were in 2009. And as we've grown, the greatest concern that I and our wonderful Deputy Director Alan Cowman have had is that as we grew, we would dilute the quality of what we do. 
And what we do is to make discoveries that shape scientific thought internationally and translate these into improvements in health. We report in lots of different ways to the board on these two elements of our mission, discovery and translation. And what has been extraordinarily gratifying is that by every metric, the scientific quality of what we do has been sustained over the last 15 years at the same high standards that were set by our researchers in the 1980s, the 1990s and the noughties. That's no small achievement and what's more, our performance in, translational, in translation and entrepreneurship have increased. And I say this not because it's something for which I or Alan take credit, but to reassure you that all of our theme leaders, division heads, lab heads, postdoctoral fellows, research assistants, students of all types, and the professional services staff that empower and enable our researchers are just as talented, just as creative, and just as hardworking as ever, and in my opinion, more sophisticated and more resilient. They are the people you support, they are the people who put their shoulders to the wheel day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out, to deliver on the trust that you place in us. As a researcher, a key part of our job is to communicate the discoveries we make. And as I said, the main way we do this is via peer-reviewed publications. Many of our papers are published in the best journals. They're read and influenced top scientists around the world. They're well cited. And importantly, they influence the way the world considers disease prevention, diagnosis and treatment. And I want to highlight, as is traditional at the AGM, five publications from WeHi in 2021. The first was driven by the work of a PhD student, Zhang Yan Gan, and Professor David Commander, who you've heard from at AGMs previously, and various contributors who have solved a decade-long mystery producing a live action view of a critical protein linked to Parkinson's disease called PINK1. Great names. The discovery was published in Nature and shows how the protein is activated in the cell where it's responsible for initiating the removal and replacement of damaged mitochondria, which are like the little power plants in every cell. When the protein is not working correctly, it can starve brain cells of energy, causing them to malfunction and in the longer term die, as happens to dopamine producing cells in Parkinson's disease. This work was picked up by the mainstream media, including channels seven, nine and 10 on their regular nightly news broadcasts. Public interest in diseases of the aging is growing as people live longer and seeking to enjoy a high quality of life throughout their later years. A very major asset we have at WeHi is our scientific animation team led by Drew Berry. And I'm looking forward to introducing you to Drew shortly, who will then introduce Etsuko Uno to present her latest scientific animation, which is highly relevant to this paper. It's called Ubiquitin and Parkinson's Disease. Our ability to use these incredibly precise, scientifically accurate animations, which are also beautiful, to tell the story of our discoveries enables us to reach a much, brief, uh, much broader audience. Our animations are also often the difference between getting a story on the nightly news, inspiring the next generation of PhD students, or explaining a highly technical concept to the next generation of budding scientists. They are truly a wonderful wee high asset. The second paper I'd like to highlight is the work of Dr. Charlene Nyack and a team of collaborators at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre who have for the very first time shown that acute myeloid leukaemia cells with the same genetic blueprint won't necessarily behave in the same way. And this has serious implications for how we target these cells with therapeutics. The team developed barcoding technology dubbed Splinter, single cell profiling and lineage tracing, which helped the researchers to identify the unique genes expressed in each leukemia cell and monitor how this influences the cancer behavior over time. They could then observe which acute myeloid leukemia cells are most likely to form cancerous tumors. 
And again, the work was published in Nature and the implications for these findings are really powerful. The third paper highlights the global impact of our research at WEHI. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a study led, led by Associate Professor Sant Rain Parisha, who's effectively known at WEHI as Santa, in collaboration with Dr. Yana Hamadani from the International Centre of Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh, and Professor Bev Biggs from the Doherty Institute has concluded that the gold standard current preventative iron treatments have absolutely no impact on a young child's development. The study measured the impact of iron supplements on cognitive function in children and their behaviour and their development in rural Bangladesh and found that as you would expect, while iron supplements improve anemia in children, these interventions had no impact on cognitive function, behaviour or development. The study is expected to help inform future global health policy guidelines about the use of what are expensive iron interventions for hundreds of millions of children worldwide and will let us better target health spending in ways that are effective. The fourth paper I'm highlighting today was led by a multi-institutional collaboration between Australian academics and industry leaders in infectious disease and antibody therapeutics at WEHI. The Doherty Institute, the Burnett Institute, the Kirby Institute in Sydney, CSL, Affinity Bio and CSIRO. Again, a collaborative effort that I think highlights the way WEHI likes to go about doing its research. WEHI's Professor Wei Hong Tam co-led a study that identified antibodies that blocked the SARS-CoV-2 virus from entering cells in preclinical models, paving the way for clinical trials of monoclonal antibody treatments for the prevention of severe COVID-19 infection. The research indicates these monoclonal antibodies are leading candidates to be developed into a treatment for COVID-19, particularly preventing severe disease in older people and those who are immunocompromised. Published in Cell Reports, the research highlights the impact of this collaborative consortium-led effort, bringing together the expertise of Australian academics and industry leaders, as I said, in infectious disease and antibody therapeutics. The final paper I wanted to highlight is the work of Dr. Raymond Yip, Associate Professor Ed Hawkins, Professor Jeff Lindemann, and Professor Jane Visvader, along with other colleagues at WEHI, who've developed enhanced imaging technology that can model how breast cancer cells invade and spread into bone and re-modify themselves to fuel tumour growth. Using WEHI's Centre for Dynamic Imaging, the team found that tumour spread occurred at specific locations in the bone, not randomly as previously thought. They also showed that the breast cancer cells renovate the bone to create an environment that fuels their spread while starving the body of essential nutrients. The work was published in Nature Communications and generated significant mainstream media attention. I really believe that this, body, this paper embodies the collaborative spirit at WEHI and the way we leverage cutting edge technology to enable bigger, bolder strides to be taken in our research efforts. I'm very passionate about all of our publications at WEHI and this is really just a small snippet of the exciting research happening in collaboration with partners in Melbourne, around Australia and overseas. These researchers could not have succeeded without your support. On behalf of all of our researchers, our staff, our students and the board, I want to thank you. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Drew Berry, Biomedical Animations Manager and fearless leader of our talented WEHI TV team. For our in-person attendees, on your way up to the Davis Auditorium this afternoon, you will have walked past the new digital display in the Galleria. Drew has worked uh, exceptionally hard on this display to have it ready for launch today at our AGM. And I'll now ask Drew to come up and give us a brief update on the latest WeHi TV developments before handing over to Itsuko in his team for the launch of her WeHi TV animation, Ubiquitin and Parkinson's Disease. Drew. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. It's always such a, a great pleasure and honour to be able to present uh, what we've been up to at the AGM. 
I only have 60 seconds, but we've had a blockbuster year. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to highlight a few of the things we've been up to in the last 12 months. Like, like all things, uh, We High TV had um, a number of significant delays um, because of COVID and a number of projects had to be on hold. And two uh, particularly significant ones, which were upgrades to We High's uh, unmissable architect architectural artworks, um, both were started in 2019 and only now in the last year have uh, been switched on. The first being an upgrade to uh, our Illuminarium. This is the Illuminarium 2.0. Um, the new Illuminarium is twice as bright as before, so it works beautifully during the day. It uses less than half as much electricity, which is terrific, and is 100% more reliable, which is making me very happy. <laughs> The Luminarium is a lighthouse beacon for scientific discovery. It illuminates the darkness to expand our knowledge and reflect the We High motto, Brighter Together. Displaying real scientific imagery and images and research data captured here at We High, the Luminarium reveals what's going on inside to the outside. Next slide, please, Simon. And those of you wandering through the building, Park Fruel, the Park Fruel building in the last day or so may have noticed switched on for the first time yesterday, um, the new 25 meter long uh, video wall running along the Galleria corridor connecting the two Weehai Parkville buildings. The upgraded screen is now sharp and ultra high resolution, making it perfect place for showcasing of Weehai's Art of Science uh, finalists and winners, as well as all the gorgeous data, simulations, microscopy, and mind blowing research that goes on here. The Galleria Corridor still has some tweaking and behind the scenes work to go, but and before our launch later this year, which will coincide with the 2022 Art of Science exhibition. We also are best, better known, best known for our uh, animation, or We High TV for our animation productions. And last year we concluded a, a multi-year project of biomedical animations um, delivered in collaboration with HHMI BioInteractive. Uh, where we publish for free for science education a large collection of animations on respiration, a 101 classic uh, biology uh, topic, revealing step by step every single enzyme in this process, uh, recreated from more than 100 uh, X ray crystallography models, uh, cryo EM, um, and, and molecular dynamics simulation. Um, I'm glad to have also that project concluded. Um, in addition to our classroom biology topics, uh, we also produce animations specific to the research here at WeHi. In presenting uh, this year's animation, I'm delighted to hand over to Etsuko Uno to present her latest animation on the molecular me mechanisms of ubiquitin and its role in Parkinson's disease. So thank you. Hello everyone. Um, so our latest animation is about the protein ubiquitin, um, and as the name suggests, um, it is found ubiquitously around the, in our bodies in nearly all cell types. Um, so ubiquitin is quite special in that it can tag other proteins, modifying um, their function and location in, this, in the cell. Importantly also, genetic studies have implicated members of the ubiquitin pathway in the development of early onset Parkinson's disease, a debilitating condition affecting the nervous system. Proteins associated with Parkinson's disease include PINK1, which we've heard about, um, and Parkin, both of which uh, are heavily studied here at WEHI. So the animation illustrates how these proteins act to add ubiquitin to the surface of the mitochondria, which is a specialised compartment in the cell. This movie was a collaboration with the ubiquitin signalling division headed by David Commander. Um, I'd like to thank him for his guidance, along with others from the division, including Grant Dusen and Bernard Lechtenberg. Um, I also like to thank Drew Berry and uh, Justin Muir for their ongoing support as well. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Ubiquitin and Parkinson's disease. Ubiquitin, a small protein found in all eukaryotic cells, plays a central role in controlling the fate and activity of other proteins. Ubiquitin attaches to other proteins, tagging them for various outcomes within the cell. Like all proteins, ubiquitin is a linear sequence of amino acids. Ubiquitin is made up of 76 amino acids. Key residues include the methionine at position 1, 7 lysines, 
and the terminal glycine residue. Inside your body, the ubiquitin protein forms a distinct three-dimensional shape with methionine, lysines and terminal glycine residues, all in defined positions. Ubiquitin attaches to the substrate via its terminal glycine residue. Attachment of one ubiquitin molecule to a substrate protein is known as monoubiquitination. Ubiquitin can also form chains on substrate proteins. A chain is formed when the terminal glycine of a second ubiquitin attaches to one of the methionine or lysine residues in the first ubiquitin. In this example, the terminal glycine of the second ubiquitin binds to the lysine in position 11 of the first ubiquitin. This forms a lysine 11-linked diubiquitin chain. For comparison, this is a methionine 1-linked diubiquitin chain. Ubiquitin can form longer chains, such as this tetraubiquitin. and can also form branches. Different ubiquitin chains are identified by their unique three-dimensional shape and electrostatic surface. Just a few examples are shown here. Ubiquitin tagging creates a molecular code that controls protein function, activity and disposal. For example, Lysine 11 and Lysine 48 linkages, when attached to a protein, signal that this protein is to be removed by proteasomal degradation. Other proteins recognise these specific ubiquitin tags and direct the proteins to the proteasome for destruction. Methionine-1 linkages are involved in immune signalling. Lysine 6 and 63 linked ubiquitin chains are involved in signalling by PINK1 and Parkin. Both these proteins have been implicated in the development of Parkinson's disease, a destructive neurological condition of the brain. Parkin and PINK1 in Parkinson's disease. Mitochondria are compartments or organelles of cells that are key to providing the cell with energy. If mitochondria become damaged or dysfunctional, proteins on the mitochondrial outer membrane become tagged with ubiquitin. Decoration of mitochondria with ubiquitin signals for the organelle's destruction so that it can be replaced. Firstly, the protein PINK1 accumulates on the mitochondrial outer membrane. PINK1 attaches a phosphate group to ubiquitin in a process termed phosphorylation. This is the protein Parkin, which functions to attach ubiquitin. Normally, Parkin is found in an inactive form. Two subunits are important for Parkin activation. UBL, or ubiquitin-like domain, and the Ring2 domain. Parkin is activated in a two-step process. First, the UBL domain is dislodged after binding to phosphorylated ubiquitin. The UBL domain is then phosphorylated by PINK1. UBL finds a new binding position and dislodges Ring2 domain. This is the active form of Parkin. A carrier protein delivers ubiquitin to active Parkin. Active Parkin receives ubiquitin from the carrier protein via its Ring2 domain.
Parkin transfers ubiquitin to accessible proteins on the mitochondrial outer membrane. Activated Parkin can conduct multiple rounds of ubiquitination. Parkin can also create ubiquitin chains, such as the lysine 63 linked diubiquitin shown here. The newly added ubiquitin attracts more parkin in a feed-forward mechanism. A heavily ubiquitinated mitochondrial surface signals its destruction. Disruption of this process is known to cause early onset Parkinson's disease. Scientists at WEHI are developing tools to better understand the Parkin ubiquitin mechanism with the hope of discovering new therapies for this devastating disease. a brilliant animation and you may think that that level of detail is unnecessary and why do these scientists keep going deeper and deeper into the cell but it's this sort of analysis when we think about the colony stimulating factors and signaling that Don Metcalf and Nick Kohler and Tony Burgess and others worked on or if you think about the development of venetoclax it's this level of understanding about cell death or cell communication that leads to our ability to develop therapeutics and treat patients. Um, and, and I think it's that depth of understanding at a molecular level and a cell level and the creation of this really solid, reliable platform of knowledge that is that sets WeHi apart as a place for pharmaceutical companies and organisations like the Wellcome Trust and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to come here and partner with us in the development of that. And I think this um, Itsuko really encapsulates the beauty of the science that we do, but also the importance in that understanding of that level of detail. It's hard, I think it's very hard to top a presentation like that. Uh, bad luck, Jim and Misty. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a, in a moment. It was always good at a conference giving a seminar after a terrible talk because there was no place but up after that. Um, I'm going to introduce Misty and Jim in a moment, um, but I do want to mention um, a highlight of 2021, which was the creation of the Brain Cancer Centre. What you might not know about is the genesis of the centre. When I met with Carrie Bickmore in 2019, the very first threads of that idea were woven together and we agreed to find a new way to invest together in the problem that is brain cancer. My excitement about the potential of the centre has grown almost exponentially since that day. It took two years of really important discussions with Carrie and her team for us to, I guess, crystallise the opportunity to adopt a radically different approach. We resolved to move from a fragmented research model to a collective one, one that can create a critical mass of researchers that are committed, coordinated and concentrated, which we call our Brain Cancer Centre Dream Team. In October last year, we took the Brain Cancer Centre to the public and we had over $40 million of investment from our partners, including $16 million from the Victorian State Government to establish a unique perioperative clinical trials platform about which you will hear more. We've also created four discovery streams and piloted a new model for recruitment of laboratory heads, where we provided multiple researchers the opportunity to pitch to co-run a laboratory from day one that was at WEHI focused on brain cancer. And it was very much modelled on the collaborative endeavours that we've seen from wonderful researchers like Jeff Lindemann and Jane Vistvader in the breast cancer area. I think that collaborative ethos 
really captured the imagination of scientists because the applicants for that position were truly outstanding and Carrie Bickmore and I were delighted that we were able to appoint a trio of wonderfully talented researchers, a fundamental biologist, Dr. Sarah Best, a bioinformatician, Dr. Saskia Freytag, and an oncologist, clinician researcher, Dr. Jim Whittle, to co-head a new brain cancer research program. I think you get the idea that the centre's a little bit different. And while this centre has been conceived and established by WEHI and carries beanies for brain cancer, when we launched, we brought together and funded researchers from RMH, from the Royal Children's Hospital and MCRI, Peter Mack, the University of Melbourne, UQ and Monash. And indeed, the majority of the money that's been raised so far doesn't stay at WEHI. It leaves to support the surgeons and oncologists and clinician researchers and research nurses and coordinators who are so essential if we're to succeed in our bold ambition, which is to end brain cancer as a terminal disease. WEHI has tackled huge problems collaboratively in the past, and we've been successful. Our approach is pretty simple. Bring together the best minds with an acute sense of urgency and a long-term determination and resilience. It's an acute sense of urgency to provide the greatest possible uh, hope for patients diagnosed with brain cancer today, balanced by the patient's resilience and determination to do the long-term research that will lead to better outcomes for every brain cancer patient. We know, we know these things seldom um, progress with miracle cures. We know we have to put our shoulder to the wheel and we have to incrementally improve the outcomes for one group of brain cancer patients and then another group of brain cancer patients and another group of brain cancer patients. And what we want to do is to move from a 4% five-year survival to 10% and 20% and 40% and 80%, just as we've seen with brain cancer and just as we've seen with blood cell cancers. I'd like to introduce two key members of the new Brain Cancer Centre research team, Associate Professor Misty Jenkins and Dr Jim Whittle, and they're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the early investments made by the centre partners in our four discovery themes and our clinical trial platforms. But before Misty and Jim come up, I'd like to play a very short video featuring some of our collaborative research partners at the Brain Cancer Centre. And I really do hope you feel as inspired as I do hearing directly from such a talented and passionate group of experts who really are the key members of our dream team. What the Brain Cancer Centre offers is opportunity and hope. For me, as a clinician who's been doing this for 20, 25 years, I can see that the field needs an injection. I can see the field needs some enthusiasm. And I can see that it needs some really clever young guns. We've already got people on board. We've got expertise and we've got experience. We've got enthusiasm and we've got intellect. Often as a fundamental scientist, we work in our preclinical models and rarely get the opportunity to truly work with clinicians and surgeons and patients to translate our findings back to the clinic. The Brain Cancer Centre to me is extremely exciting. One of the biggest hurdles that I've had as a clinician researcher is I can come up with an idea that I know is important for my patients, but sometimes putting that into practice is quite difficult. And that's simply because I don't have that skill set. My skill set lies elsewhere. But if we can take all the bright sparks with all of their skill sets and strengths and combine them into one place, then we can set a fire that allows us to achieve outcomes for patients. And if we can support that through funding, through early career researchers, through fostering of relationships, then that fire can burn well into the future to continue to achieve outcomes. I think what really excites me about the, the Brain Cancer Centre is it's not just funding research or a research project. It brings us and all our back diverse backgrounds and uh, expertise together, which leads to things that can't be predicted. So, you know, I've sat in multidisciplinary meetings where, you know, I'm absolutely sure what's going to happen with a certain patient. And there's someone there from radiology or, you know, a radiation oncologist who has, um, you know, this excellent idea about maybe a treatment paradigm for a patient that we hadn't considered. And I, I think 
It feels to me like the Brain Cancer Centre is the multidisciplinary meeting of research. <laughs> what excites me about my research is that it's, it's different. To it's, 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 it represents a whole new arm of brain cancer research. Experimentally, it was the day that we saw that the treatments that we had been working so hard for years to develop in our lab cured mice of the glioblastoma tumours that we'd implanted. It was such an incredible day built on so many years of work prior to that. I think the time is now to, to make that step of all those clinical trials, that what does success look like. Now is the time. I, I really think that we've got enough a critical mass now that that, that could happen for, for our patients. We can solve the brain cancer problem. We haven't had enough research yet. The brain is a tricky place to work and we've seen the evidence in other cancers, particularly other solid cancers, where they've had huge levels of investment in research that has directly resulted in outcomes for patients and increased life expectancy. So with the same sort of, res the same sort of investments, then we absolutely will be able to translate that in this to brain cancer as well. Brain cancer patients need to know that we know that this is an urgent problem. It's urgent for them and they need to know that we understand. This centre provides an amazing opportunity. Um, it's brought some of the best and brightest minds together and now they just we just need to back them. I hope for patients in the future that uh, we have good treatments that make brain cancer a chronic disease rather than the awful disease that we see today. And I guess my personal long-term goal would be to pull myself out of a job. <laughs> Thank you. It is hard to, to top those two presentations. Um, thank you, Doug. Uh, we high board. Uh, special thanks to Carrie Bickmore, Sam McGuan, and all those who've been involved with the vision to establish the Brain Cancer Centre. It's a great privilege for us to be here today and to have the opportunity uh, to describe how we're working together to address the challenges of brain cancer. As outlined by Doug, the Brain Cancer Centre is a virtual model that embraces partnership, collaboration and team science as fundamental values. Out of this, a new lab was formed. Established six months ago, the Brain Cancer Research Laboratory, jointly led by Saskia Freytag, Sarah Best and myself. And in addition, the support for eight established laboratories across Brain Cancer Centre partners focused on brain cancer. We all embrace the concept that the problem cannot be solved alone and that we must partner with others to achieve the vision that brain cancer is treatable, one day survivable, and that a patient can thrive beyond the experience. Echoing Doug, we aim to play our role in a global effort that improves the lives of brain cancer patients now and into the future. I did want to briefly introduce our new lab model. And of course, joint lab head teams are not new However, our tripartite team structure provides an opportunity to bring together diverse background and skills to provide a vision that combines fundamental biology, applied bioinformatics, and clinical translation with a focus on improving patient outcomes. And this unique approach allows us to build a program that takes learnings from other cancers and other fields, uh, bringing new tools and analysis and preclinical platforms to expand the use of bioinformatics and machine learning for new stratification of samples coming from the laboratory and the clinic. And ultimately working internally as a team, but more importantly as part of the broader mission to develop new treatments and combinations for patients. And I'll hand over to Misty to give an overview of the Brain Cancer Centre discovery themes. Sweet, yeah. it's okay. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. And, um, and so essentially, um, you know, the Brain Cancer Centre has really four distinctive discovery platforms under which it has initially funded nine separate projects. And as already outlined, this is not just within WeHi, of course, but this is also a very collaborative team science partnership with all of our partners, um, not only even in Victoria, but also interstate. 
And really, this is our strategy on a page, if you like. These projects are designed to work synergistically um, by sharing information and resources and expertise. So every dollar, every thought, every idea is shared um, among all the researchers. And we really want to do something quite disruptive here. We're creating a truly authentic team science approach and really aim to reduce the silos that exist in research and turn every researcher and dollar pointed towards that same central vision. So our research strategy is unique, we believe, on the world stage and I think really has the potential to derive significant interest um, and impact. And it's really led with these four pillars, pathways to new medicines, understanding the blood-brain barrier, understanding the tumour microenvironment, both within the tumour but also circulating, um, and also um, immunotherapy. And all of these um, research themes, if you like, are, are underpinned and supported by the establishment and investigation of uh, new disease models, which are really central to these research themes. So I just have one slide now on each of these research themes to give you a high level um, take home of the kinds of uh, research questions that we think are really fundamentally important. And so this first research theme called the Pathways to New Medicines is really about taking drugs that we already know work against cancers and testing them in brain cancer, as well as the development of new therapies. And so you'll all be familiar with the, the story of the now famous venetoclax, which is a, a BCL2 inhibitor, which has completely changed clinical practice and really saving lives. And in this program of discovery, researchers are examining the development of both, um, both uh, drugs like BH3 mimetics and other inhibitors of cancer growth. And um, these teams have recently shown that BH3 mimetics and another drug called a CAT6AB histone acetyltransferase may be good, a good cancer therapy for glioblastoma. And so the real challenge for this team is to identify agents that can inhibit the brain cancer growth and kill the tumours, um, but that can also actually get in and access the brain. And that's why these, this program works close synergistically with understanding the blood-brain barrier. You see... The brain is a tricky thing to work. It's a delicate um, location and, in, you know, many drugs can, cannot infiltrate it. And that's been evolutionarily designed, if you like. You know, we've, uh, as humans, our, you know, our brains have evolved to protect us from disease um, and toxins and damage and infection. We, first of all, we have a thick skull. We have protective fluids. We have the cerebrospinal fluid and protective membranes called the meninges. And, in, in fact, in the late, as an immunologist, I must also say, say that, you know, in the late 19th century, the Nobel laureate immunologist um, Paul Ehrlich injected, was the first to inject a dye into the bloodstream of a mouse. And to his surprise, it infiltrated all of the tissues um, except the brain and the spinal cord. And now we understand this to be the blood-brain barrier. So for the most part, we, we need that. It keeps, us, um, it keeps us healthy and our brain protected. But of course, to effectively treat um, brain cancer, we're going to need to find clever ways to overcome it and to trick the BBB into allowing those drugs and therapies to enter. Uh, not only, of course, for treatments, but I think also importantly for diagnostics. Our next um, pillar, research pillar theme is understanding the brain tumour microenvironment. And um, this has really been an area of research that's been quite unexplored in, in brain cancer. And we know that the, the you know, tumours don't exist in isolation. They exist in an ecosystem. And um, that that environment with, in which they exist um, has a lot of different critical regulators of cancer progression, both for primary uh, but also for metastatic disease. So the unique properties um, of this organ require a specific framework. We need to understand what those positive and negative regulators of disease are, not just in the tumour, but also in all of those cells that surround the tumour. And what I'm showing you here actually is one of the beautiful images um, from the lab where this is a, actually a, a, a glioblastoma in pink in, in the brain. Um, this is in a mouse brain. And in this beautiful video here, this is um, by Matthias Milazani uh, using the two-photon microscopy suite here at Wehi, that you can start to see all of these cells interacting with the tumour. And so, you know, by understanding these sort of environments, we can then manipulate them um, and target the, them with therapies to treat disease. So this brings me to the fourth pillar, um, and again, they all work very synergistically, which is immunotherapy. And really, immunotherapy is using a patient's own immune system to fight their own cancer. And it's been an absolute game changer for cancer therapy, particularly for patients with blood cancers. And so we're trying now to apply um, these sorts of approaches in the brain. 
And at, um, excuse me, at the Brain Cancer Centre, we are identifying new targets on the tumour cells to then direct these immune killer cells to. And this is this video I'm showing you here is of a white blood cell in the orange attacking a blue cancer cell and delivering the kiss of death. And so this is happening all the time in our bodies, but we can actually engineer these cells and direct them to kill the cancer cells. And so there are, is a large team um, that, are, uh, that are developing these, these therapies. And you heard from Beck Abbott in that video before that they're now working quite successfully in our animal models. And so, of course, we work very closely with the BBB team uh, and, and understanding the tumour microenvironment to work synergistically and bring all of these programs of research together. So at the core of the Brain Cancer Centre is a sense of urgency to create opportunities for patients now. And this is facilitated through close connection of the discovery themes directly to the clinic so that the new findings can benefit patients sooner. And in addition, we have a mechanism to collect patient data in the brain registry, as well as biobanking efforts to support research, representing an iterative feedback loop from bench to bedside. The collection of clinical data matched with biospecimens is critical to clinical research. And in brain cancer, this has historically been challenging due to a number of factors. This is a rare cancer, often with decentralization of care and follow-up, and historically low levels of attention and funding. However, with the leadership of Peter Gibbs and Lucy Gately, amongst others, we now have access to the brain registry that enables the collection of multi-site data into one resource in a combination with biobanking as well. And this is a powerful combination that can drive research and efficiency, as well as contributing to drug discovery and development. And at the heart of our clinical program is a focus on novel clinical trial designs, trying to do things differently. And this is to address the understanding that the traditional phase one to phase three pipeline has failed our patients. And this is a harsh reality, but it reflects an incomplete understanding of brain cancer biology, as well as the disconnect between preclinical drug development and what actually happens in the clinic. Perioperative trials which are common in other cancers, but are so far untested in brain cancer, allow the connection, collection of contemporary tissue prior to therapy, and then a subsequent surgery on treatment to allow a before and after comparison. And this is gonna provide a unique opportunity to answer two fundamental questions. Do drugs get to where they need to go? And do drugs have an effect in the brain? And that brings me to the Brain Perioperative Program, or Brain Pop. Together with colleagues, Professor Mark Rosenthal and Professor Kate Drummond, as well as other partners from the Brain Cancer Centre, we've established Brain Pop with a $16 million commitment from the Victorian government. And this is a really exciting and novel development. It represents a broad inclusion of patients children with brain, primary brain cancer, adults with primary brain cancer, as well as those with metastases from other sites. The development of advanced diagnostic tools in the form of new genomics and imaging modalities to ultimately best predict the right option for the right patient. And hopefully this will be fed from our discovery programs with new immunotherapy, new precision medicine targets and developments in radiation to then undergo patients have a second surgery on treatment and to answer these questions, does the drug penetrate the blood-brain barrier that Misty described? Can we establish an on-target effect? And ultimately, for an individual patient, are they likely to benefit? Because if that is so, then they can continue on that therapy. However, if there's no benefit for a patient and it's unlikely to help, or a progression, there's an opportunity for ongoing individualised treatment refinement over time. We're really excited to establish this program with um, some work to start very soon. And once we've been able to confirm the, the face safety and feasibility of this model locally, I think we can expand to other sites and provide an opportunity for Australian leadership in brain cancer trials. So, I think we're really on the verge of something quite exciting here, and I, I hope that you can you can feel that and get that sense of this in the room. And for those of you online, um, you know there have been no new treatments in decades, 
The way we treat brain cancer patients now is the same way we've been treating brain cancer patients 30 and 40 years ago. We need new approaches. They are urgently required. We need a fresh lens to be applied to this wicked problem. With sustainable and ongoing funding, we can take our team science approach where we share the data, the tissue from the trials, um, resources, expertise, and develop new diagnostics and new treatments. Our approach is patient-centred. We will also work very closely with an essential team of our um, patient advocates and consumers, and they provide uh, a really unique, um, insightful and thoughtful um, patient and carer perspective to our work. So here at the Brain Cancer Centre, we're completely committed to providing real hope, um, an opportunity now, um, but with really a focus on long-term change. As, as Doug said, this is not false hope. You know, it, research takes time and resources and it, it's, you know, we're not going to have new treatments overnight, but um, I think that, you know, we really have assembled a really great team and it can happen. And that team is, um, is at WeHi, but also finally to acknowledge it's not just as WeHi, we're also part of a bigger Australian brain cancer community that exists beyond the Parkville precinct. And there have been dedicated and passionate scientists and clinicians and consumers and patient advocates who have all been collectively looking to develop lasting relationships. And, you know, we look forward to working with all of our national partners and our international partners. And so change will only happen through embracing this collaboration and partnership. Thank you for your time. We are happy to take any questions if there are any. Questions for Jim and Misty? They will be circulating out in the foyer um, and you can nab them there if there are no immediate questions. Thank you, Misty and Jim. Uh, I think you can really sense the passion and enthusiasm that they have and that their whole team has. What I'm really excited about is this is a model that is informing our approach in other cancers. Um, and I think it's one that's built on the ethos that Gus and Suzanne established here, that you know, we, when we work together, when we bring people that see the world in a different way, we can achieve um, remarkable outcomes. I think it's really relevant for diseases like pancreatic, ovarian and breast cancers, just to name a few, colon cancer, blood cell cancers too. I think it's really relevant for diseases of ageing like Parkinson's disease and dementia and with devastating childhood diseases. And of course, with immune, infectious and inflammatory diseases. And it encapsulates the sort of approach you've, he you've heard Alan Cowman talk about over many decades. I really look forward to sharing our plans in these different areas with you over the next couple of years. Now it's time to introduce Professor Marnie Blewett, who's Joint Head of the Epigenetics and Development Division and Head of Scientific Education to present the Metcalf Scholarship Awards and the Professor Lynn Corcoran PhD Prizes. Marnie. Thank you, Doug. And just to echo everybody else's comments, it's really nice to see a full audience. It's hard to welcome new students to the Institute last year with an empty auditorium and just thinking you know that they're online at home, but you can't actually see them in person. So the first awards that I'd, or the scholarships I'd like to announce are the Metcalf Scholarships. The Metcalf Scholarship Fund was established in honour of the Institute's beloved researcher, Don, Professor Don Metcalf, who passed away at the end of 2014. So the scholarships are there to out support outstanding young undergraduate students so they have their first foray into the lab and really hopefully get a taste and a passion for science. The Metcalf scholarships are awarded um, a research placement opportunity and that it spans through all of our themes, all of our divisions and research projects um, spanning the research that happens in infectious diseases, in immunology, cancer, diseases of ageing, developmental disorders, in, com in com computational biology and development of new technologies. And so we're really fortunate that so far, since their inception, we've had 44 bright, enthusiastic um, young students come and join the Institute, and that hopefully have really enjoyed their time here. And so thanks to the generous support of the donors who made a gift to the Institute in memory of Don, we've been able to support those 44 students and continue to be able to welcome new undergraduate students that are simply outstanding um, each year. And so I think it's really a highlight for us to get to meet them here each year. And this year I'm going to announce the next six winners. So I can tell you that they're all wonderful, two of whom I've met personally and have had really fantastic scientific discussions with. And so the, the future is really bright with having these wonderful people join us. 
So the first, I'm going to announce them in alphabetical order. The first is Eric Choi, but unfortunately, like many people around Australia, he can't join us here tonight for obvious reasons. So congratulations, Eric, and you can receive, um, once you're able to come back into work again, you can receive uh, your certificate um, um, separately. The second is Ruby Dempsey. The next is Suroi Fang. Ti Kan Vi Nguyen. Eugene Wang. And Lucinda Shao. So the second set of prizes that I'm announcing tonight are the Lynn Corcoran PhD prizes. So you may remember these. These were in, um, initiated in 2017 um, in honour of Professor Lynn Corcoran for her tireless support and mentorship to um, students over the many decades that she worked here at WeHi. Um, so these are, in, uh, are awarded to the top PhD students who had their PhD passed in the previous year, so in 2021. So um, we had these in this, since 2017, and last year's one was actually one of the people we've just heard from, Jim Whittle, actually, who's here. And so you can see the, the, the amazing quality of the students that we have at WeHi. So this year I'm pleased to announce our two winners. Um, the first is Dr. Alyssa Robbins from the Immunology Division, and her PhD title was Cell Death Mechanisms in T-Cell Differentiation and Homeostasis. So Alyssa's not able to be here tonight, but I'm going to present the award to Daniel Gray, her supervisor. Uh, the second um, goes to Dr. Liu Yi Chan. Um, so he uh, put, undertook his PhD in the Epigenetics and Development Division, my division, um, and his PhD title was New Protocols and Computational Tools for Single-Cell RNA-Seq Analysis. So Lee has already taken up his postdoctoral position um, at the Broad Institute in Boston, and so of course he can't join us tonight, but I will also present his um, certificate to his supervisor, Matt Ritchie. So that concludes the um, presentation of the Education Awards. Thanks for your attention. And that concludes the annual general meeting. Thank you all to both our in-person and our online audience for joining us tonight. For in-person attendees, we'll now move to the Tapestry Lounge for refreshments. Online audience, you'll have to provide your own refreshments. <laughs> and I hope to see you in person soon. Good night and thank you all for coming. <laughs>